What would you do if you were confident that the Bible is true? You see, the Bible makes an extraordinary claim that it is God's message to us all. And it's, it's often said extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence to support them. So in this session, we'll go through some of that evidence and the reasons why we believe the Bible is true. Now, something can be true, like a chemical equation, and you can shrug your shoulders and say, well, that doesn't mean much to me. But the Bible contains the kind of truth that means you can't just walk on by. It offers abundant life, eternal life, to anyone willing to sit under God's authority. So it's not a cliché to say it's a matter of life and death. So to that question again, what would you do if you were convinced that the Bible is true? I'm Simon, and I invite you to begin to review the evidence. So let's start with a question. How do you end a book well? An arresting opening sentence can hook your reader. But a powerful ending can leave its mark long after we close the book. Now I can't read the last lines of House at Pooh Corner without a lump in my throat. Christopher Robin is leaving the Hundred Acre Woods. The grown-up world beckons. It's time to say goodbye to his bear. So they went off together. But wherever they go and whatever happens to them on the way in that enchanted place on the top of the forest, a little boy and his bear will always be playing. Sniff. It's a, mer a memorable finish. Or the end of Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, where the hero Carton is going to the guillotine for another man. It's a far, far better thing that I do than I ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. Great stuff. A great ending. But what if you've written a book describing the scientific discoveries about the beginning of the universe? How do you finish a book like that strongly, where the subject matter is dry and unemotional? Well, I reckon Robert Jastro, author of God and the Astronomers, hits it out of the park. He was a NASA astronomer and not a Bible believer. And every time I see his book quoted, it's always, always the closing words, always the last paragraph. They're just so good. What he's masterfully done is sum up the whole of his book in his closing word picture. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there having a picnic for centuries. I added the bit about having a picnic. So what's going on here? Why does Jastra write that scientists in the 20th century were having a bad dream? Everything these scientists looked at pointed to a beginning of the cosmos. And the beginning was outside time and space. In fact, it was a point when time and space came into existence, when literally no thing existed. And that meant, and I quote another unbeliever, a proponent of such a theory that the universe began to exist at a particular time in the past, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the matter of the universe came from nothing and by nothing. From nothing and by nothing? That's an incredible statement. You can see why unbelieving scientists were so unhappy at having to accept this. But what is Jastrow's point about the theologians sitting there for centuries? You know, the ones having a picnic. And by theologians, he means those who base their beliefs on the Bible. Well, that is why the scientists were so unhappy. What they had discovered is what Bible readers had always understood from, God, from what God had recorded in the pages of Scripture. Bible believers said to the scientists, in effect, what took you so long? We always knew that the universe had a, beginning, had a beginning. God told us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's clear. The Bible tells us that the cosmos had a beginning. But there is a key difference between the Bible believer and the atheist. Both believe in a beginning, but the Bible believer knows what all reasonable people know. 
that every beginning needs a beginner. Instead of believing that the universe came from nothing and by nothing, the Bible tells us it was by God. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. Now, when talking about science, we should remind ourselves that science can be wrong, scientists can be mistaken, and scientific theories can change. But the core claim that our universe traces back to an absolute beginning and is therefore finite in history has been the standard view since the 1960s. So the question for us all is, how did the author of Genesis know these things thousands of years before modern science discovered them? Our subject is, why believe the Bible is true? Now, we know something or someone is true when they prove consistently trustworthy or reliable. Now, the way that the Bible shows itself dependable is that it contains truths that no one could have written unless God supplied the information and guaranteed its accuracy. So, on Jastro's make-believe mountain, the Bible readers greet us and tell us the Bible has got it right on the big issues of cosmic beginnings and that science is really just catching up. What would you do if you were confident that the Bible is true? So we were on a mountaintop and now we travel downwards and it's time to think about the sea and the fish in it. This is an image that has, has stuck with me from school. It's a picture of how history is written. And you might be puzzled. I was studying this book, What is History? And that's not the most exciting read, but the writer suggested we should see the historian as fish fishing in a huge sea of facts. He lays them out and says, in effect, these series of fish facts they show what happened. Now, the Bible is full of history in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when the writers lay their facts out like fish on a slab and, and they say, there, see my facts, that's what happened. Can we trust the Bible historian? We ask, are your facts really facts or are they a bit fishy? Well, we're going to look at some examples that show something quite reassuring that when people criticise the Bible and they say that didn't happen, the archaeologist has frequently dipped his net into the, into the sea of buried artefacts and fished out an inscription, an ancient seal, a statue, and we can gain confidence that Bible history is good history. And again, this will give us confidence that we can believe the Bible is to be trusted. So let's look at some examples. And what better way to do that than in the British Museum in London? We're going to see how credible and reliable the Bible historians are. So for thousands of years, no one knew of an Assyrian king called Sargon. There was one mention, however, in the book of Isaiah, God's prophet to Israel. He wrote, in the year when King Sargon of Assyria sent his commander in chief to capture the Philistine city of Ashdod. So Isaiah makes a clear historical claim. Sargon is king of Assyria, and he came and he waged war against Israel. And it looked like the Bible was in a bit of a difficult spot. There were ancient Assyrian king lists, but Sargon's name was not to be found. So critics were quick to suggest Isaiah had made an historical blunder. Then in 1870, King Sargon's extensive palace was discovered at a place called Korsabad. And here he is, great King Sargon. He's the one on the left, one of the most powerful rulers in the ancient world. Isaiah was historically correct to talk about this king. God ensured Isaiah's contribution to the Bible was accurate. This is one of the most famous exhibits in the British Museum and provides more powerful evidence that criticisms of Bible history are doomed to fail. It's called the Cyrus Cylinder. And it tells of a decree by the Persian King Cyrus, which he made after he had overthrown the Babylonian Empire. It tells the world that all the exiles taken captive during the time of the Babylonian Empire could return to their home countries 
and rebuild their temples. So why is that important for the student of Bible history? Well, the Jewish people were in Babylon at that time, and the Bible tells us that Cyrus decreed that the Jews who were captives in Babylon could return to Israel. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up, and may the Lord their God be with them. And then the book of Ezra records how the exile ended and the Jews went back to their homeland. You see, before the cylinder was discovered, historians scoffed at the idea that an ancient ruler would do anything so enlightened as to send exiles back to their homes. But this cylinder shows they were wrong. Against all the expectations of the historians, the Bible was correct. Sometimes it's what is not said that is more significant than what is. This is known as the Taylor Prism, an official record of the Assyrian king Sennacherib. It reports his attack and siege of Jerusalem. And his attack is recorded in the Old Testament Book of Kings. So that means we can compare the two. The Bible tells us that the king of Judah in Jerusalem, Hezekiah, prayed to God for deliverance and God intervened. Many Assyrians died, perhaps of sickness, and Sennacherib returned to Assyria. Now, in the record of the prison, Sennacherib boasts how he shut up Hezekiah like a caged bird. But crucially, he does not claim he took the city. He did conquer other cities in Judah, including Lachish, and celebrated that victory in these amazing wall reliefs that he set up in Nineveh. Here are the Assyrians attacking, and there the people of Lachish try to repel the Assyrians, but ultimately they are led out of the city and as captives they are overcome. And here is Sennacherib surveying all the booty from Lachish. It's a great victory, but is it really? It's only Lachish, which is not the capital. There is no relief showing the conquered Jerusalem. It can't be stressed how neatly this relief and the record on the prison Dovetails, dovetails with what we read in the Bible. First, we have agreement between the history as recorded in the Bible books and the Assyrian official record. But it is what is not said that speaks volumes. Surely if Sennacherib had actually defeated and captured Jerusalem, it would have been mentioned on the cylinder. This is another powerful example from history, why we can have confidence that the Bible is true. So three powerful examples that you can see for yourself in the museum, and there are so many more. Bible history is to be trusted, and this means one more reason why we can have confidence that the Bible is true. So we've looked outwards at the physical world in the Genesis beginning, and we've looked out from the historical passage of the Bible and seen that the findings of history bolster our confidence in the Bible's reliability, and we can call those external evidences. Time now to take a review of the internal makeup of the Bible and see how the unity and consistency of the Bible points to one master author. The Bible is a collection of 66 books by about 40 different authors written over a period of at least a thousand years and more. And yet the harmony running through all these books is outstanding, too astonishing to be accidental. The authors could not possibly have created it on their own. They lived centuries apart. This is the whole Bible without words. Step one, God creates everything and pronounces it very good. Step two, the first couple, Adam and Eve rebel, and this explains our rebellion against God. Step three, God responds to the rebellion by choosing and forming Israel, who are called to live under his reign and show the world what life is meant to be. But they constantly fail. Step four, God's plan reaches a climax with Jesus. After a sinless life, he is crucified, he rises from the dead and he ascends to heaven. And step five, God works through the new followers of Jesus. The gospel of forgiveness of sin is preached and the church grows. Step six, at the end of history, Jesus will return in glory and establish God's rule over everything. 
Now, all the writers of the books of the Bible assume this framework as a backdrop to their writing. It's in the DNA, if you like, of every writer of the, book of the, of the books of the Bible. It was provided by God. So from Genesis to Revelation, there's one steadily unfolding, consistent story. God has a plan for the earth and the human race and is slowly but surely seeing it through to completion. Now, how likely is it that all those authors, the soldiers, the kings, the prophets, the fishermen, a tax collector, a lawyer, a doctor, some men writing from the earliest part of civilization and men from the completely different world of first century Rome, how likely is it that all those different writers would agree to this one message? It's frankly impossible. Humans do not agree. Look at this. It shows the splits and divisions among Christians that arose after the Bible was completed. God doesn't promise to keep harmony in the church, as is clear from this graphic. But he did promise to keep the message of the Bible reliable and consistent while it was being compiled over the centuries. And looking at this division, it's just unbelievable. The unified message of scripture could have been the result of human collaboration. The consistent message is God given. Now we'll take a look at one of the most amazing hallmarks of this unified message, that God would bring about healing and fix the curse of sin in the most unexpected way, by giving his son to die for us. The Bible's consistent message is that to fix sin, God would require the death of a good man who is condemned unjustly and dies the death of a criminal. Now, I've read this experiment repeated many times and with different people, and the result is always the same. A portion of the Old Testament is read out to someone who has a reasonable education but has rejected the Bible, and the reader asks, who is being described? And the listener says, well, it's clearly a description of Jesus. And the reader asks again, where do you think it comes from? And the listener says, well, I don't know, actually, but it must be from the New Testament. And then the listener is astounded to discover that the portion read is from the Old Testament and, in effect, has admitted that the Old Testament points unmistakably to Jesus. But the Old Testament was written centuries before Christ was born. Only God could have supplied this foreknowledge to the human authors. Here are a few example scriptures that are read out in experiments like this. Those who hate me without a cause are more no numerous than the hairs of my head. I gave my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who tore out my beard. I did not hide my face from scorn and spitting. They pierced my hands and my feet. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now these five passages come from a very, very long list. The others we could have shown set out where he was to be born, the family line he would come from, the manner of his betrayal, down to the amount of money, 30 pieces of silver paid as a bribe, and the method by which his execution has divided his clothing. Now, the official Jewish interpretation is that the descriptions of the individual's suffering describes the Jewish race and not Jesus. Now, one look at Isaiah chapter 53, which is where our last two examples were from, is enough to show how misguided this interpretation is. Every verse fits Jesus. So few of them could possibly be applied to the Jews. Try fitting this passage from Isaiah 53 to any nation, let alone the Jews. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. That can't refer to a nation. Nations don't get assigned graves near to rich men. These Bible predictions of Jesus and his death for humanity's sins are too many and varied 
to be explained away. Jesus himself remarked on the evidence of these prophecies. The scriptures point to me, he said in John chapter 5. So, what would you do if you were convinced the scriptures are true, with a consistent message that believing in Jesus is saving death on the cross is the only way for you to get right with God? Presenters in this series will have their own favourite reason why they are convinced the Bible is true. Here's one I find really powerful. Jesus is the most influential person in human history for a good reason. And no one could have invented him. That he is the most influential is hardly disputed. We date our calendar from his birth. Now, a couple of scientists tried to find who was the most significant person in history. And here's the book that they write, that they wrote, Who's Bigger? They wanted to answer the question where historical figures really rank in terms of their significance. And they did a lot of data mining and wrote algorithms to interpret the data. And their conclusion who was the most significant, who was number one, was not surprising. There's the top ten. Now, there are many political, powerful leaders in that list, leaders of nations. Most are at the modern end, last few centuries or so. There are only three ancient there, Alexander the Great, Jesus and Aristotle. And the question we have is, why would Jesus be on this list? Why would he be on top? Jesus was an obscure, nomadic rabbi who lived 2,000 years ago. But this is what he said. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. That's the kind of outrageous thing a deranged, a deranged maniac might say. But Jesus is saying, there's something about me that is attractive. Something about me is magnetic. And he was right. What he predicted has happened. Jesus speaks to people in all cultures, in all ages. How likely was that? Now, you can make a case why Jefferson or Hitler or Alexander the Great should be in that top ten. They're influential leaders of powerful nations. So how does this man from Nazareth come top? He's born a peasant. He dies at a young age. He never writes anything. He never commands an army or wins any wars. He never makes any great political contribution. Why should this man be the most influential person in human history? The story of Jesus is simply uninventable. It's the story that no one could have written. It is the story that no one would have written. Try this experiment. Remove, if you can, the story of Jesus from your mind. It's hard. And then imagine writing the story of a man who would be the most significant man in all of history. A story of a saviour or a deliverer of mankind. You'd write a, super a superhero story of a, a superhuman kind of individual. To write a story of a deliverer who delivers in a way that all hero heroes do through power and through force and ultimately through violence. That's the story you'd write. You wouldn't write the story of a man being crucified, a man of obscurity and insignificance, saving the world. No one would have invented that story. But you know it's the best story. It's a true story. And it's a story worth putting at the centre of your own life. So back to our question. What would you do if you were confident that the Bible is true and you meet the uninventable Jesus in its pages? You know, if we take the Bible to be true, we'll trust it to be the guide of our lives. If it's true, we'll allow our lives to be influenced by it and listen to it where it speaks and look to it for comfort and for encouragement and guidance and instruction. If the Bible is true, we will submit to the Bible 
and we will place ourselves under its authority. You see, in the pages of the Bible, which we can be confident is true for the reasons we've seen, we encounter God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find out about the abundant life which can be ours now and forever in the new creation.